Okay, we are going to go ahead and get started. So uh, we are so thrilled that you're here, and um, I'll introduce myself and Patrice. I'm Julia Geyer, and this is Patrice Peoples, and we're the 2023 uh, co-chairs for Council for Life's Young Leaders for Life. Um, and just wanted to say that uh, we're thrilled you're here because we are hearing so many voices in the world about how uh, abortion is self-care and one life matters more than another and how pre-born babies are not constituting of human life and we're excited to have Scott here and to have you all here to um, give a, a voice to the other side and the voice of the truth which is that um, all human life is valuable and that uh, you know Christ tells us that, that he loves all life, and, and that's sort of the foundation of what we're doing here tonight. Um, I just want to briefly give a background on Council for Life. We are an organization that started in 2001 with the goal to um, support uh, every woman facing a, a difficult life decision, anyone who is searching for the truth amongst the noise and to equip one another to take hold of this truth that all life is valuable. And specifically, they, the, their tagline is to empower women, men, and youth to make life-affirming choices. And the way that we exercise that goal is through um, community education, which is what we're doing here, and also financial support for like-minded agencies that um, that serve our community and support the life issue. And I'm gonna read, read what some of those um, agencies include, maternity homes, pregnancy resource centers, adoption and foster care, abortion pill reversal, post-abortion support, parenting and life skills education, youth and college mentoring, and targeted media outreach. And as I said before, we are, most importantly, deeply committed to reflecting Christ-like love, mercy, grace, and forgiveness in all that we do. Um, and Leanne is going to run through some slides for us just to show you. This is our mission, uh, the Council for Life mission. This has been prayed over and, and um, articulated through the years as Council for Life has grown as an organization. So. They want to make sure that they get the message across that um, that this is, uh, sorry, they're, they're tremendously grateful for the work they do to help vulnerable, frightened women choose life for their babies. Um, I also, let's see, this, these are the resources. On your table, you have several items, and one item has several resources, books, movies, songs, and social media, including the Council for Life website and the YouTube channel, which has several videos that you can watch from past Council for Life events. Um, there's also an infographic, the one sheet that is kind of the skinny paper on your table, and that has just tons of fast facts that are great numbers about our state and local uh, resources and data. Um, Oh, and finally, there's a form on your table for joining as an advocate for life, and you can join for as little as a, do a dollar, I believe. And I think Leanne is going to speak at the end. There's an exciting opportunity that maybe I will let her share at the end. That uh, if you want to wait to fill that out, um, it, there's a great incentive to join, not just um, to promote a culture of life in our abortion-minded culture, but also to support the organization. And I'll hand it over to Patrice. <laughs> Hello, so we'd like to thank Al Phoenix for hosting our second event here. And also we'd like to thank Arthur Wade for being a faithful advocate for Council for Life and being here with us tonight. Um, before we um, have him um, open this up in prayer, I wanted to make you all aware of an upcoming service project that we have with um, Mercy House. 
Mercy House is a maternity home in Colleyville that houses single pregnant women, providing them support, life, and parenting skills through the love of Christ. So their current group is about to graduate here in March. And they need volunteers to come and deep clean the house after they've moved out and to also do, um, oh gosh, what is that called? Landscaping, that's the word, <laughs> landscaping. So we'd love for you to sign up for it. We don't have the exact date yet, but the sign will be at the back table and we'll be able to email you information. And if you're thinking about it, you don't want to sign up today, but if you're still thinking about it, you have our email addresses in this event that was sent out. So be sure to email us and we'll make sure you get that information as well. So we do have some great El Phoenix dinner tonight. So before you get all lined up, we're going to have Father Wade pray over us. And a few, uh, some information about Father Wade is that he's a chaplain and director of the Catholic Campus Ministry at SMU. And before joining his current ministry in 2020, he served at St. Monica's Catholic Church in Dallas as a parochial vicar. And after being ordained in the priesthood in 2018, he grew up in Highland Park and received a call to enter seminary during his college years at Boston College. He's on the Council for Life Advisory Board and a wonderful ally and advocate for the sanctity of life. And we want to thank you, Father Wade. blessings over this meal and this evening. Lord, we thank you for the spirit which has inspired so many men and women, especially through Council for Life, to protect life, not just in word, but in deed, financial gifts, through physical support, through friendship, and as we'll learn through Scott tonight, through constructive conversation, seeking the conversion of hearts. I ask that your Holy Spirit continue to unite all of us as brothers and sisters in Christ, to see the dignity of every human person, including those who disagree with us, so that through your love shining through us, they may see and know you who made us all, beginning in the womb. And I ask that you bless this food to our use and us to thy service through Christ our Lord. Amen. How many of you like arguing? Some of you are too holy, you're just not gonna admit it. How many of you, when you argue, you wanna win? If your hand is not up, you're lying or you need counseling, I'm not sure which. <laughs> We're gonna talk about arguing tonight and I'm gonna tell you why, men and women. With the reversal of Roe v. Wade with the Dobbs decision, as Leanne pointed out, everything has shifted. We are no longer behind the curtain. I like that illustration, I'm gonna steal it and give you no credit for it. Um, <laughs> We no longer are hiding behind a curtain. We are all pro-life apologists now. And if you're wondering what an apologist is, an apologist is not someone who says he's sorry all the time. I feel that's what husbands do. Actually, an apologist is someone who lays out a case for what he or she believes, and all of us are going to have to know how to do that in a post-Roe world. Even in the great state of Texas, we're gonna to have to know how to do that. So what I want to do tonight is I'm going to lay out what the pro-life argument is and then tell you the five bad ways people are going to respond to the argument. And here's why that matters. A lot of times we think, oh boy, i got to memorize every objection they're going to throw at me. No, you don't. When you leave here tonight, you'll know how to slot every objection you'll hear, almost every objection you'll hear, into one of five bad ways people argue. And once you identify the bad way that the, the person is arguing, it's much easier to dispatch with that objection. So that's where we're going to go tonight. And uh, I'll tell you what I told the group this morning. When you leave here tonight, you will know how to defend your pro-life view in one minute or less. The door will be locked. You will not leave until you demonstrate that you've mastered it. Do we still have that slide, by the way? Oh, good. We may need that. Uh, the good news is you're going to be able to take it home on your phone tonight. We're going to give you something to text in a little bit. <clears throat> so let's start with the three most important words in defending your pro-life view. You'll want to remember these. These three words are absolutely critical. Word number one, syllogism. Some of you are going, wait a minute, what on earth are you talking about? I don't even know how to spell that word, let alone know what it means. Syllogism, S-Y-L-L-O-G-I-S-M. Here's what a syllogism is. It is simply a couple of premises followed by a conclusion that hopefully logically follows. 
We use syllogisms all the time. Here's one. Socrates is a man. All men are mortal. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. Notice the, the premises and then the conclusion that follows. Or when you were a teenager, maybe you heard this. Dad, Mom, can I use the car Friday night? No, you may not, son. Why not? Because you remember we made a deal. Your driving privileges were predicated upon you having a decent GPA. F plus is not a decent GPA, therefore you will not drive. That's a very unfortunate syllogism if you're asking for the car keys in that case. But it's a syllogism. Pro-lifers have a syllogism. And if you don't stick to it like glue men and women, especially in a post-row world where all bets are off, people are going to continually change the subject on you. Have you ever been in an argument, those of you that are married with your spouse, and you were winning? The Lord knew you were winning. Every rational mind in the universe knew you were winning. And your spouse changed the subject. Has that ever happened? Raise your hand if that's happened to you. Okay, a few honest people here. I won't ask how many of you changed the subject when you were losing. But <clears throat> people love to change the subject when they don't know how to respond to what you're saying. And if you don't keep the main thing the main thing, you'll be chasing bunny trails all night long when you're talking to somebody. So you want to keep your argument clear and keeping tethered to your pro-life syllogism that I'm going to give you in just a moment is absolutely essential in doing that. So what is the pro-life syllogism? Here it is. Premise one, it is wrong to intentionally kill innocent human beings. It is wrong to intentionally kill innocent human beings. Premise two, abortion intentionally kills innocent human beings. Abortion intentionally kills innocent human beings. Conclusion, therefore abortion is wrong. It's wrong to intentionally kill innocent human beings. Abortion does that, therefore it's wrong. Now let me say something right up front about that syllogism. There is only three ways you can defeat that syllogism. One, you can show the argument is invalid, meaning the conclusion does not logically follow. If you do that, the argument's defeated. Or you can show one or more of the premises is false, meaning untrue, which means the argument is unsound. Or you could show that the terms are not used clearly. Outside of that, your argument stands. <clears throat> it's important to know that. Pardon me, I just went through puberty. Let me grab a <clears throat> glass of water. Outside of that, your argument stands. And what you'll find is that people will not address your argument. They will try to change the subject. I was uh, bored a while back, as I mentioned earlier today, at lunch. And I decided to go tune into that bastion of conservative thought known as The View on television. And uh, there was Whoopi Goldberg saying, anybody that's opposed to abortion, all they're doing is making a religious argument. That won't work. Arguments are sound or unsound, valid or invalid. Calling an argument religious is name calling. It's lazy. You're not doing the hard work of refuting the argument. You're just calling it a name. She was being lazy. This is an example of what I mean. So what are the five bad ways people tend to argue? Here's what they do. They will assume rather than argue. They will attack rather than argue. They will assert rather than argue. They will confuse preference claims with moral claims, and they'll hide behind the hard cases. That pretty much sums up every objection you're going to get to your pro-life case. So let's look at those. They assume rather than argue. Father, do you have a brother? I do. What's his name? Jim. Jim. Have you stopped beating your brother Jim yet? Uh, yes. I yes. Have. You know, that was a real slow answer. Would you all extend your hands? We need to pray for this brother. Uh, that was way too slow. Uh, when did you stop? Uh, what, day, is it, what day of the week is it? Oh, boy. Okay, really extend your hands. Many years ago. Many, many years ago. I want all the Pentecostal students up front right now. We've got some deliverance that needs to happen here. Now, was my question fair to Father? What did I assume? How much evidence did I give you that he beats his brother? Zero. I simply assumed it. By the way, thank you for being a very good sport. Uh, you will find time for my counseling needs, right, as that wedding date approaches? We'll, we'll talk. Okay, good, because then I won't pick on you anymore. Um, I assumed he beats his brother. What was the point of my question? I was trying to prove what by asking the question? That he beats his brother, but I made no claim with any evidence at all. I simply assumed it. 
This is a term you don't need to be rem you don't need to remember, but it's called begging the question. It's where you assume what you're trying to prove. Begging the question is not what a lot of people think it is. A lot of people say, well, that begs the question. What they really mean is that raises the question. You beg the question when you assume what you're trying to prove, like I assumed you beat your brother, and you don't give any evidence for it. And people do this with the unborn all the time. They simply assume the unborn aren't human. They don't argue for it. So let me give you an example. Imagine you're talking to somebody, and they say, well, you know, women should be trusted to make their own personal decisions. And you're thinking, how do I answer that? Well, notice for a moment, just stop for a moment. What are they assuming about the unborn when they say that? That they're not human. Because would they make that same argument if we were talking about killing five-year-olds or three-year-olds? No, they only make that argument with the unborn because they assume the unborn aren't human. Joe Biden, who I wasn't going to name tonight, but decided I would at least give his initials. Um, <laughs> Joe Biden on the anniversary of Roe v. Wade said the following, reproductive health care, by which he means abortion, is, quote, good for everyone, unquote. Mr. President, with all due respect to your office, is, does everyone include the unborn? Is reproductive health care good for them? Do you see how he just assumed the unborn weren't human? He didn't argue for it? Uh, any of you ever read The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn? Okay, you may remember this chapter in chapter, or this passage in chapter 32. Huck Finn has been out on an adventure, and he happens on the property of Aunt Sally. And Aunt Sally sees him coming down the road, and she rushes out to meet him, and she says, where have you been, my boy? And she's all mixed up. She thinks it's Tom Sawyer, and she's confusing it. It's really Huck. But Huck doesn't know what to do, so he makes up a story. Here's this woman asking him, where were you? We've been waiting for you. So here's what he concocts as a story. He says, well, ma'am, we were on a steamboat, and it blew a cylinder head. That's why we're late. And Aunt Sally says, my gosh, was anybody hurt? And, she, and he says to her, no, ma'am, only a Negro, but not anybody. Now, what was just assumed about the black man? He's not a human. He's not one of us. That's right. It wasn't argued for. It was simply assumed. And people do this with abortion all the time. And if you don't recognize this assumption, you're going to end up looking like an extremist if you don't call it out. They'll say things like, you want to force a woman who already has 10 other kids to bring another child into this world she can't feed? And you're thinking, my goodness, how do I appear compassionate? Well, that assumption is right there. Would they make this argument if somebody wanted to kill their teenager to make the family budget balance? Never. They only do it with the unborn because they assume. So I'm going to teach you a little tactic for dealing with this. It's called trot out the toddler. And it doesn't mean that you compare a toddler to a fetus and say, if the toddler is human, so is the fetus. You're going to use science to do that. Rather, what you do is you use trot out the toddler to demonstrate that the issue, what is the unborn, is the real issue, not the objection they're raising. So you're talking to somebody, and they say, well, why don't you trust women? And you're thinking, oh boy, how do I prove I, I don't hate women, especially if you're a guy? No, wrong answer. Here's what you do. First question in your mind, would this argument they're giving me work to justify killing a toddler? And then I want you to very simply hold your hand out at knee high and say, pretend I have a two-year-old in front of me. His parents want to rough him up in the privacy of the bedroom and they want us to trust them to make their own personal decisions. Should we allow them to do it? What's the answer going to be? No, and your, your reply should be two words, why not? Well, because he's a human being, your reply should be one word said musically. Ah, some of you will do that better than me. When I sing, things die, but you get the idea. Ah, what? If the unborn are human, like that toddler, should we kill the unborn in the name of trusting people any more than we'd kill a toddler for that reason? Well, that's not the same thing. The unborn aren't human, the toddler is. You could be right about that, but I need you to argue for it, not simply assume it. Do you see what we're doing here? We're making them argue for their assumption, not merely get away with assuming something they haven't proven. So let's try one together. You're talking to a friend at, over the counter at work, and they say, you know, I just don't get it. These right to lifers, they don't do anything to help children after they're born. And, uh, you know, what if there's a poor woman that already has a bunch of kids and she can't afford any others? You would force her to bring another child into this world? And you're thinking, oh boy, how do I deal with this? Trot out your toddler. 
I have a two-year-old in front of me. His parents already have 10 kids. Now they've got 11 and they can't afford to feed this two-year-old. Should they be allowed to execute them so they can balance the checkbook at the end of the month? What's the answer going to be? No, you can't do that. Your reply? Those of you that said, aw, oh, you're too anxious. Why not? Why not? Because he's a human being. Ah, oh, the ah oh, what? Not aha, uh -huh. ah. Uh, if the unborn are human, like that toddler, should we kill them intentionally in the name of economic hardship any more than we'd kill a toddler for that reason? Oh, that's not the same thing. The unborn aren't human, the toddler is. Ah, you may be right about that, but I need you to argue for it. Maybe I'm wrong, I'm open-minded. I'm tolerant, I'm open-minded. I'll hear your view. If you make a good case, I'll buy it. But I need you to argue for it. You can't just assume the unborn aren't human. Does this make sense so far? That assumption that the unborn aren't human is everywhere, up and down the editorial pages of our newspapers, in newscasts, on blog posts, social media, and you have to know how to expose it for what it is, and trotting out your toddler is the most effective way to do that. Um, let me give you another example of where people assume the unborn aren't human. Oh, you're against abortion? You just want women to die in the back alleys of America, don't you, from dangerous coat hanger abortions. Now notice this argument. One thing pro-lifers typically do when they hear, hear this, they go right to statistics, and I don't want you to do that. They'll say things like, well, it's not true that women died in mass numbers from illegal abortion prior to Roe v. Wade. You're right, they didn't, but that's not the first thing you should say. You were just told about a woman who died from an illegal abortion. What should your first response be? Empathy, right? Empathy. You know what? I agree with you. Any woman that dies from an abortion is a tragedy. You and I agree on that. But notice that your objection assumes the unborn aren't human. And how do we know that? Because unless they assume the unborn aren't human, their argument is tantamount to saying that because some people die in trying to intentionally kill other innocent humans, we ought to make it safe and legal for them to do it. Should we legalize bank robbery so it's safer for felons? I mean, this is a very silly argument, and it only works if you assume the unborn aren't human. Don't let them get away with that assumption. Call it out. By the way, it's not true that women died by the thousands. I'll give you just a couple of quick pointers on this. And I'm going to give you four pro-abortion sources that reject the claim that women died by the thousands from illegal abortion. So here's pro-abortion source number one. Dr. Mary Calderon, Planned Parenthood's own medical director during the 1960s, wrote that the death rate from illegal abortion was so low it wasn't even worth remarking on. In fact, she said, with the introduction of penicillin, the death rate had plummeted to the point where it wasn't even being talked about in the medical literature anymore. And furthermore, she said, 90% of all illegal abortions are, are not done with guys with rusty coat hangers. They're done by established physicians in good standing in their own communities. That's Planned Parenthood's own medical director, not a pro-life source. Pro-abortion source number two, Dr. Christopher Teets, statistician for Planned Parenthood, said the claim of five to 10,000 deaths a year from illegal abortion was, quote, unmitigated nonsense. That's Planned Parenthood statistician, not right to life statistician. Here's a third source, Daniel Callahan, who wrote the book Abortion, Law, Morality, and Choice. He wrote that the death rate of five to 10,000 a year from illegal abortion could never be true in any conceivable universe. And here's why, he said. 40,000 women die of reproductive age every year, he said, from all causes, car wrecks, cancer, disease, to claim that so high a number as five to 10,000 a year come from one single source, illegal abortion, can't be true, doesn't work. That's not a pro-life guy, that's a pro-abortion guy. Fourth pro-abortion source, Dr. Bernard Nathanson, who later did become pro-life, but while he was still performing abortions, told the New York Times that he had presided over 60,000 deaths and that the claim of five to 10,000 deaths a year from illegal abortion, he made that number up and the press bought it and ran with it. He confessed he made it up. So notice that you don't have to cite pro-life sources, you can cite pro-abortion sources for this. Uh, second bad way people argue, they attack rather than argue. They don't deal with your argument, they go after you personally. Oh, you're a man? 
By the way, when people say to me now, you're a man, what right do you have to speak on abortion? I want to look at him. The snark side of me comes out. I look at him and I say, how do you know that I'm a man? You know, I mean, <laughs> really? In today's pronoun era, you're going to assume that? How dare you assume my pronouns, you know? I don't say that, but I'm so tempted to. I mean, really, this is the era of Caitlyn Jenner. Can we be a little more up to date with our language? Um, but notice that, again, what is the most important thing to remember? What are our three key words? What were they? Syllogism, syllogism, syllogism. Do pro-life women use the same argument as pro-life men? Yes, they do. They use the same exact syllogism. Does it follow then that you can refute our argument by, because I'm a man? No. Arguments stand or fall apart from one's gender. You have to do the hard work of refuting the argument. It doesn't do any good to say, well, you're a man. That's not going to do any good. Pro-life women are using the same exact arguments. Arguments stand or fall on their merits, folks. This is something that conservative Christians get real uneasy about. They think, oh, I've got to prove I'm not a bad guy when people attack you. Your argument is independent of you. It's independent of how well you live it out. It's independent of how well you apply it in every area of life. Your argument stands on its own merits, period. And I'll give you an example outside the abortion issue. There was a guy by the name of Christopher Hitchens who was an atheist a number of years ago. You've heard of him, Father. And um, Christopher Hitchens did not like Christianity. And he wrote a book that was meant to refute Christianity called God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything. And if you want a catalog of all the evils done in the name of Christianity, his book is where you should go. He trots it all out. He doesn't miss anything. It's all there. The Crusades, everything he picks up. But here's the thing. Did he refute Christianity by showing that Christians didn't do a good job living out their faith? And the answer is no. Now, you didn't know you were going to get this tonight, and I didn't clear this with you, Leanne, but here goes. I'm going to teach you how to debunk Christianity right now. Pro-life speaker rejects the faith. Film at 11. No. Uh, let me explain to you. If you, want to read, if you want to prove Christianity false, here's all you have to do. Prove the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth never happened, and the game is up. By the way, before you throw arrows at me, that's what St. Paul said. In 1 Corinthians 15, he said, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead bodily and historically, we're dead in our sins, we have no hope, and we're the world's biggest joke. So that's the Apostle Paul saying that. In other words, you've got to show the resurrection didn't happen. Does Hitchens do that? No. All he does is attack individual Christians and say, oh, these Catholics over here do all this bad stuff, and you Protestants are no better over here. Okay, maybe they are that bad. It doesn't disprove the resurrection of Jesus. He didn't deal with our argument. He just attacked personally. Here's another one. Oh, you're pro-life? You're against all killing? Really? What about war? What about capital punishment? So right away, they've distorted your argument. But suppose you were inconsistent. Suppose you are totally against abortion, but totally for the death penalty. Now, by the way, I'm not making a case here about the death penalty tonight. Everybody just follow me. My point is this. Even if you were inconsistent in the way you applied your ethic, could your argument still be good even if you didn't live it out consistently? Absolutely. Or how about this one? Oh, you're, you're uh, against abortion? How many unwanted kids have you adopted? None? There goes your whole case. All right, let's go to our syllogism. Suppose I am the most awful individual in the world. I'm unwilling to adopt kids. I don't give a straw about them once they're born. I'm that bad. Could my syllogism that abortion is wrong still be valid and sound? The answer is yes, because it stands independent of me. I mean, how does it follow that because I'm unwilling to adopt a child, an abortionist may intentionally kill one? I mean, really, imagine me saying to you, unless you agree to adopt my three sons by noon tomorrow, I shall execute them. Now, it's not going to happen. They're all bigger than me. But if you turn, play along, if you turn down my ultimatum, would that justify me killing my sons? No, because their right to life exists independent of how you behave. These are the things you've got to stay focused on like a laser beam. It's your argument that matters, not you personally, all right? That doesn't give you a license to be a jerk, 
but it does mean your argument stands or falls apart from you. Uh, I'm trying to think of a couple other ways people attack. Uh, any of you listen to Dennis Prager? Dennis Prager is a phenomenal guy. He's on the radio. I love Dennis Prager. If you want to learn to think clearly, Dennis is your guy. He's a conservative Jew. He's not a Christian. Prager U videos, you've seen those, right? The five-minute videos that are so great on conservative issues. Well, Dennis and I, years ago, before he was totally pro-life, he is now. He's very pro-life now. We had a conversation on abortion. And he said, Scott, here's your problem. You say you're against abortion from conception, but you won't pick up a gun to stop it. And if you're unwilling to pick up a gun to stop it, that means that your case is just history. Well, maybe I'm just a chicken. Maybe I just lack courage. Could my syllogism still be good? By the way, I do think there are good reasons not to pick up a gun, so don't, don't misconstrue what I'm saying here. What I'm getting at is, suppose I was just a coward. Could my pro-life argument still be good if I'm a coward? Yeah, absolutely. Or, you know, hey, can the unborn still be human even if I'm a chicken? That doesn't sound right. Um, can, if, if I'm afraid to live out my view, can the unborn still be human? Yes, because the evidence is what matters, not me, how I behave. All Dennis was doing at that point was attacking me for being inconsistent. Here's what I didn't ask him, but I wish I had at the time. Dennis, do you believe there's a Holocaust going on in Kosovo? And at the time there was. Have you picked up a gun to stop it? You see how that sword would cut both ways? In other words, it's arguments that matter, not behavior of the individual person. Um, they, another thing people do is they assert rather than argue. Tell me if this is an argument or an assertion. You ready? All right. Women have a right to choose, argument or assertion? Assertion because I gave you no what? Evidence. No evidence. How about this? Socrates is a man, all men are mortal, therefore Socrates is mortal. Argument or assertion? Argument because I've got premise, premise, conclusion. How about this? My wife is not here with us tonight in Dallas, therefore she is eloped with Elvis in Las Vegas, and Michael Jackson is doing the music for the ceremony. Argument or assertion? Who says argument? I heard an argument out there. You are correct if you said that. Did I have a premise and a conclusion? I have an argument there, folks. By the way, if you ever tell my wife I said this, I'll have to kill you and I'm pro-life, okay? Now, is it a good argument? No, it's complete garbage, why? Because it doesn't follow that because my wife isn't here, she is in Vegas. There's a lot more likely explanations out there than that she's with Elvis, right? But notice that a lot of what passes for pro-abortion arguments don't even rise to the level of an argument. They're just assertions. And here's my question for you as we talked about at lunch today. Who bears the burden of proof when someone makes an assertion? The speaker or you the listener? Ma, me. If I claim there's pink elephants swinging from those exit signs back there and those of you that are looking right now are doing the right thing, I don't, I, you don't bear the burden of proof, I do, I'm making the claim. If somebody says an embryo is not even self-aware and you know we don't need to value it because it's not self-aware, who bears the burden of proof, you or them? Them, they need to explain why self-awareness matters. And you know what happens typically to pro-lifers? We get all, we end up buying their premise as we're trying to refute them. They say, why that embryo is not even self-aware. And we say, well, yes, they are. They have brain waves by week six. When you answer that way, what did you just do? You bought their premise that brain activity is what gives us value. Challenge it. How self-aware do I have to be? How much brain activity do I have to have not to be killed? And why that level and not some other level? Make them do the work of defending their own claim. Instead of saying, oh, well, you know, a fetus can feel pain by week 12 and all of a sudden now you just bought their premise. Don't buy their premise, challenge their premise. And I want to give you a little tactic for doing it that my friend Greg Kokel calls the Colombo tactic. Uh, you all are very too, you probably, most of you are way too young to remember Colombo on TV. Uh, how many of you saw the movie The Princess Bride? Okay, you know the old guy reading the story to the kid? That was actor Peter Falk and he was Lieutenant Colombo in the television series Colombo. And Columbo was about a detective who everybody thinks is dumb, but what they don't know is he's dumb like a fox. 
He just keeps asking questions until he nails the crook. So he'll show up on the scene and he'll say, Dr. Jones, where were you tonight at the 12th? Okay, thank you very much. You know, Dr. Jones, there's just one more thing bothering me about this. And he'd one more thing him to death with questions. And every Columbo episode ends the exact same way. He asks one question that blows the whole case open. And my friend Greg Kokel says, when people are making assertions like women have a right to choose or you shouldn't force your views on people, you can ask questions that put you back in the driver's seat instead of being on the hot seat. And he calls these the Columbo questions. And here are the three Columbo questions. Question number one, what do you mean by that? Question number two, how did you come to that conclusion? And question number three, have you considered the implications of your view? So here's an example. At the University of Maryland a number of years ago, I gave a pro-life talk and an Indonesian student stood up during the Q&A and he said, I want to thank you for not bringing religion into this. You make a very interesting case and I'm impressed. He said, however, I have a, a question. How can you say that an embryo that doesn't even have a brain, that isn't even self-aware, has no consciousness, has a right to life. And he, he was convinced he was gonna nail me. And I looked at him and I said, tell me, how self-aware do I have to be not to be killed? And, and you know, why that level rather than another? And I said, why does self-awareness matter in the first place? And he stood there, still as could be, for about 10 seconds, and then he looked at me and smiled and said, Touche. In other words, somebody had finally called his bluff and made him defend his own claim rather than assuming it. And he had been used to pro-lifers basically assuming his premise rather than challenging it. And I made him challenge it. So another, just to walk you through these three questions, many of you may remember there was a guy on TV named Larry King. Years ago, Larry, Larry King was interviewing Shirley MacLaine on television. Shirley MacLaine is an actress, and she's a witch. I'm not being mean, she calls herself a witch. And she's written on the quote, new spirituality. And Larry King is interviewing her, and he says to her, why do we need a new spirituality, Ms. MacLaine? And here was Shirley MacLaine's answer. She said, well, Larry, everybody knows the Bible's been changed many times. And Larry King, who was 106 at the time, was nodding half comatose, you know. I would have said, wait a minute, uh, Ms. McLean, that's a very interesting claim you just made. You say the Bible's been changed many times. In what way? What do you mean by that, in other words? In what way? How so? Does Shirley McLean have an answer to that question? Not in a billion years. Has she studied textual criticism? No. And so she's just making an assertion. But, but Larry didn't follow up. And then you could drop the mother of all Columbo questions. How did you come to the conclusion the Bible's been changed? In other words, what's your evidence for it? What's your proof? Make her defend her own claim. And then you could ask the third Columbo question, have you considered the implications of your view? That if you're right that we can't trust a document simply because it's old, we can't trust any of the classic literature we currently have, everything from Homer to Virgil. We'd have to toss it simply because it's old and might have had some amendments to it. And, and Shirley MacLaine had no ability to answer these kinds of questions, but Larry didn't know how to ask them. So how about, how about you? Help me out here. If I make the claim the embryo has no right to life because it's not viable, what would be the first thing you ought to throw at me? What do you mean by viability? That's exactly right. Viability does not measure the value of the fetus, it measures our technology. A child that is viable in New York at 24 weeks in utero is not viable in Bangladesh. So follow me on this. A woman who's 24 weeks pregnant gets on a plane in Manhattan and she flies to Bangladesh. Does her child go from being human and valuable as long as the plane is in New York airspace and then when it enters Bangladesh airspace, it becomes non-human and non-valuable. But then when she flies home, it goes back to being human again and valuable. I mean, these are the kinds of crazy things that follow from these arguments. So watch people who make assertions and call them out on it. Have them consider the implications of their view. Make them explain why you ought to believe what they're saying. Make them give reasons for it. Imagine you're buying a house and the realtor takes you out and says, I have found your dream house. 
you're going to love it. I can't wait to show it to you. She puts you in her minivan, drives you out to this piece of property as you're waiting with bated breath. And she points to a, a lot and you're straining your eyes to see a house and you don't see a house, but you do see a roof on the ground. And she says, that's your new house. See that roof over there on the ground? That's your new house. Are you going to buy a house with no walls supporting it? No. Why would you buy an argument with nothing supporting it? Make them build walls for their case. Make them do the hard work and you sit there and just be the polite skeptic. Why should I believe that? It's fun to be a skeptic. It really is. And you can do it in a Christian way by saying, how did you come to that conclusion? Fourth bad way people argue, they confuse preference claims with moral claims. And this is huge in our post-Roe world right now. Complete this bumper sticker. You've all seen it. Don't like abortion, dot, dot, dot. What's the follow-up? Don't have one. Uh, notice what this does. Our pro-life argument where we said abortion intentionally kills an innocent human being, we made an argument for that, our syllogism, that is what's known as an objective claim. That bumper sticker does what? It changes our objective claim to what? Subjective. So let me throw out some phrases for you. Chocolate ice cream is better than vanilla. Some of you are going, that's gospel truth. Preach it. <laughs> How about this claim? It's wrong to torture toddlers for fun. How do they differ? What's the difference between those two claims? Can somebody tell me? The one about ice cream is about my likes and my preferences. The one about torturing toddlers is not about what I like. Is it possible to like something and still say it's wrong? Yes. For example, I'm flying to LA after I get done here. <clears throat> Pardon me, I'm gonna fly home tomorrow morning, pick up my wife Stephanie in Atlanta, and then we're flying to LA and we're going to be out there for five days. My father-in-law is 88 years old and he is absolutely crazy. He has two Harleys, he collects Corvettes, he skis, he surfs, he will not die in his sleep. He's going to die at age 99 flying off a cliff somewhere on a pair of skis into the arms of Jesus. That's how he's going into eternity. Well, I know where he keeps the keys to his newest vet. And he, when he goes out and runs errands, he's oblivious to what I would do with that car. And I could take it screaming up PCH, he'd never know. But am I gonna do it, even though I'd like to do it? Maybe, <laughs> no. Uh, am I? No, I won't, because it would be what? Wrong. Morals are about what's right or wrong, and this is where Pope Benedict really nailed it when he said, before he became Pope, he said, the problem with Western civilization today is we suffer under a dictatorship of relativism. And if you can tolerate a Presbyterian who attends a Southern Baptist church interpreting the Pope, here's what he meant. We have become so flexible in our morals, you can marry your canary if you want to, but if you claim your view is true with a capital T when you're talking about religion or ethics, we're not gonna tolerate that. We will not tolerate you claiming your view is true with a capital T. And what has happened is because of this worldview known as relativism that basically says right and wrong are up to you, the individual, not any objective standard. Rather, it's up to you or your culture, but not anything we have to get in line with objectively. All moral claims are getting reduced to mere preference ones. And so when we say abortion is wrong, what do you think the culture hears? We just don't like it. They've reduced it to a mere preference. This worldview is called relativism. You ever had somebody say to you, don't force your morals on me? That's relativism. And I want to give you the three fatal flaws for it so you don't get intimidated by this because a lot of pro-life Christians think, oh, I don't want to be intolerant. I don't want to appear a bad guy or a bad girl. When somebody says to you, you shouldn't be forcing your views on others or there is no truth when it comes to right and wrong, only likes and dislikes, that is relativism. The belief right and wrong are totally up to you or your culture, but nothing objective. Relativism, though, is fatally flawed. Number one, it's self-refuting. Let me give you some statements, and I want you to pick out the flaws, even though the carbs are sitting in after that great meal, right? That was a great meal. My brother is an only child. I can't speak a word in English. You're in rare form as usual. Don't take anybody's advice on anything. The Cowboys are gonna win the Super Bowl. No, what's wrong with all those statements? What's wrong with all of them? They falsify themselves. When I say my brother is an only child, what does that make me? I can't speak a word in English, I just did. You see the problem? When somebody says to you, you shouldn't force your views on me, what did they just do? 
They forced a moral rule on you. It's like they're saying there are no moral rules. Oh, but here's one. You can't claim to be right with a capital R, or you can't claim your view is true with a capital T. You have to tolerate everybody. Says who? Why should I tolerate you if, if I choose morality for myself? The other problem with relativism, and this is something that Pope Benedict also pointed out when he was actually Cardinal Ratzinger at the time, that if you're going to say there is no objective morality, there's no substantial difference between Mother Teresa and Adolf Hitler. They just had different preferences. Mother Teresa liked to help people. Hitler, well, he liked to kill them. Who are we to judge? But we know better, do we not? We know better, absolutely. Third problem with relativism. No one can really live this worldview out. Um, C.S. Lewis said, the very man who tells you there is no objective right and wrong will complain if you steal his orange or cut him off in line. He'll say, that's not, fill in the blank, fair or right. So here's what I want you to do. The next time you're talking to somebody about abortion and they say, well, that's just your view. Don't impose it on me. You shouldn't force your morality on me. I want you politely but firmly to say, why not? Or what's wrong with that? Any answer they give you will be an example of them imposing their view on you. But this does lead us to what I think we need to confront as pro-lifers. We are now part of a culture that thinks, as Pope Benedict correctly stated, we are part of a culture that is convinced there can't be any true knowledge on morals. How do we reach people who think abortion is just a preference issue and there's no morals to be had on the issue? Well, one of the things we can do is to speak directly to their intuitions so that they can't just make excuses. We actually speak right to their intuitions by giving them a chance to view what's actually at stake in the abortion debate. If you saw the movie The Passion of the Christ, can I see your hands? Saving Private Ryan, Schindler's List, Hacksaw Ridge. Okay, I think we're at about 100% that everybody in this room you paid money to go watch a gruesome movie on the screen. Why? Same reason I did. You understood that those images, though gruesome, conveyed truths that words alone could never convey. And the abortion issue is no different. There are millions of our fellow citizens who will continue to think of abortion as an ice cream issue. You like chocolate, I like vanilla, don't judge me, until they see it. And I'm gonna show you in just a moment a very short clip. You do not need to watch it if you wish not to watch. It's 55 seconds long, and you can avoid its contents by simply looking away. The narration has been taken out of the clip, so that if you'd rather not watch by simply averting your gaze, you can avoid the presentation completely. Uh, if you do watch, let me tell you exactly what you'll see, so you go in as an informed viewer. You will not see an abortion performed, but you will see the aftermath, and I want to warn you, it's gruesome viewing. And if you don't, again, if you'd wish not to see it, feel the freedom to look away. I want to say one other thing that I think it's important for us as pro-lifers to always convey to people. I'm not showing this clip whenever I show it at a Catholic high school or a Protestant high school or at a debate. I don't show it to beat people up, and here's why. I am committed to the gospel that we see in the Bible. And that gospel presents a very clear picture about us. God creates a good world for us to worship and enjoy him, but we as a race rebel against him through the actions of our first parents, Adam and Eve. And God, who would have been perfectly just to be done with all of us. I mean, think about that. Have you ever thought about that? What if God decided he wasn't going to save anybody? Would he still be a good and just God? Yeah, he would, because we'd be getting exactly what we deserve. But the gospel is the story of Jesus coming as our substitute and standing in our place condemned so that those who trust in Jesus for salvation, the righteousness of Christ gets attributed to them and they are declared not guilty in virtue of what Jesus did for them. That's the gospel. And so whenever we show a video like this, I always stress to people that if anybody's listening and you've had an experience with abortion, a guy who encouraged a girl to abort or a woman who made that choice because you thought you had no other way out, I want you to know the story of the gospel is a God who is in the business of reconciling rebel sinners to himself. He didn't have to, but he did. And if your trust is in him, 
God the Father is no longer your judge. He's your heavenly Father, and you get adopted into his family as a dearly loved child. That's the gospel of Jesus. So I want us to keep that good news in mind as we take a minute to look at this clip. I'm showing it to you because I want you to be aware of a tool that's used to reach people who think moral claims are mere preference claims like choosing chocolate over vanilla. And in today's post-world world, we face this more than ever. So we'll go ahead and roll this. You feel the freedom to look away if you wish. I realize some of us watching this might think, boy, is it necessary to show something that provocative to make our case? And I'm sympathetic if you feel that way. But I'm reminded of a historical event that is now being depicted in a major motion picture film called Till. Have any of you seen the movie about Emmett Till? Emmett Till, if you don't know the story, was a 14-year-old African-American boy who in 1955 journeyed from Chicago to visit his cousin in the town of Money, Mississippi. And when he got off the train in Money, Mississippi, he began to brag to his cousin and his cousin's friends about the two white girlfriends he had back home. And they said, no way, we don't believe you. We don't even speak to white ladies here, let alone date them, you're lying. And when he would not back down from his story, they said, okay, punk, we dare you to talk to a white girl down here. That afternoon, the group of boys went into Bryant's grocery store in downtown Money, Mississippi. Emmett went up to the counter and that 14-year-old boy purchased a piece of gum or candy from the 21-year-old white married woman behind the counter. And as he did so, he flashed her a fl flirtatious smile and said something like, thanks, babe. You know, we don't think anything of this today. That was a very big deal in 1955 if you were black. Well, two nights later, that boy was extracted from his uncle's home where he was spending the summer by the woman's husband and another man. They drove him outside Money, Mississippi, and as depicted in the film, for several hours, they beat him mercilessly, breaking nearly every bone in his upper torso. His face was beyond recognition, and then they finally finished him with a single shot to the head and threw his corpse into the river. When the local sheriff found the body, presumably three to four days later, he could not believe the sight of this kid. He took what was left of Emmett and didn't even put him in a coffin, put him in a wooden box, nailed the coffin shut, or nailed the box shut, and put a note on there sealed with the county seal that said to Mamie Till, Emmett's mother, don't open this box, you're not gonna like what you see inside. And when Mamie Till got the body back in Chicago, about a week later, the newspaper press gathered around her and said, what are you gonna do, Mrs. Till? And she shocked the world with an announcement. She said, we're going to have a public funeral for my son, and it's going to be an open casket funeral. The newspaper went ballistic. You can't do this, Mrs. Till. Do you understand the condition your boy is in? You're going to offend people. She said these words. She said, I know it will offend people, but I want the whole world to see what they did to my boy. And that black and white photo of Emmett in the coffin, which you can Google later tonight, but be warned it's gruesome, was published nationally in Jet Magazine, and it launched the civil rights movement in this country. Three months later, Rosa Parks was told to go to the back of the bus because she was black. What gave her the courage to stand her ground and do the right thing? She tells us in her memoir. She says, I couldn't get the picture of that boy out of my head. Why are we showing pictures like this? Not to beat up on post-abortion men and women, but because men and women, I am absolutely persuaded that if pro-life Christians don't lovingly but truthfully open the casket on abortion, our nation will continue to tolerate injustice. It never has to confront and see. But here's the thing. As Christians, while we open that casket on abortion, we can also open the truth of the gospel that sinners can be reconciled to their creator because Jesus paid in full for their sin and rebellion. We're gonna offer truth and hope. 
Final bad way people argue, and then I'll take your questions. Um, uh, they hide behind the hard cases. They'll bring up things like rape. Uh, they'll bring up things like, uh, you know, life of the mother. And almost every time, they're not being honest when they bring these up. But there are two types of people who bring up rape, inquirers and crusaders, and you treat them very differently, okay? The inquirer has heard your pro-life argument. She's heard that it's wrong to intentionally kill innocent human beings. She buys into your claim that unborn are, are innocent human beings and shouldn't be killed. She's tracking with your argument. She's heard your science that from the earliest stages of development, the unborn are distinct living and whole human beings. She buys your philosophical argument that there's no essential difference between you, the embryo, and you, the adult, that would justify killing you back then. Differences of size and level of development in the environment and degree of dependency are not good reasons for saying we could kill you then, but not now. She's tracking with you, but she thinks about her 14-year-old younger sister, and she thinks, you know, if my younger sister got raped, I don't know how I would tell her she's got to give birth to a kid that will always remind her of what she went through. And she's just having a psychological complexity issue, not a moral one. She's buying your moral argument. You're going to treat her very gently, and here's what you're going to do. You're immediately going to show empathy. This is, again, where we need to be careful as right-to-lifers. It's very common for right-to-lifers to say, well, most women who get raped don't get pregnant. That's absolutely the wrong answer when you've just been told about a woman who's been sexually assaulted. What should your first response be? Empathy. And you can look at the inquiry and you can say this, you know what, you and I agree. That woman who's been assaulted has suffered a terrible injustice and we need to help her. You're completely right about that. And you're also right that the child may remind her of what she went through. You're not wrong about that. It could be the case. Given you and I agree on those two points, how should a civil society treat innocent human beings who remind us of a painful event? I mean, imagine if I did have a two-year-old up here and his father was a rapist, and every time the mother looked at the child, she remembered what she went through. Would it be okay to kill the two-year-old to help the mother feel better? What's the answer going to be? No. So notice this objection is really assuming the unborn aren't human, right? Now, the inquirer at this point is following your argument. The crusader, he wants no part of your argument. He's bringing up rape to make you look like an extremist. Oh, you're just an awful, intolerant right to life or that want to take away a woman's choice after she's been raped. What kind of awful human being are you? You're going to call his bluff, and here's what you do. You look him square in the eye, eye contact matters, look him square in the eye and say, okay, for the sake of argument, I'm going to grant that we allow abortion in cases of rape. Not my position, but I'll grant it for the sake of this discussion. Will you now join me in opposing all other abortions that have nothing to do with rape? What's his answer going to be? No, women have a fundamental right to an abortion. Okay, if that's true, a fundamental right cannot be infringed upon. That means abortion for any reason through all nine months of pregnancy. Why don't you defend that position rather than hiding behind rape victims? I'm going to call him out. By the way, calling people out also works when they say to you, oh, you're pro-life? What are you doing about the environment? What are you doing about the poor? What are you doing about inner city violence? What are you doing about gun gang violence in the inner cities? You know how you hear, you're not really pro-life, you're just pro-birth? Look that person in the eye and say, okay, suppose pro-lifers do everything you're demanding you, we do. We take responsibility for everything wrong with society. Will you now join us opposing abortion? What's their answer going to be? No. Women have a right to an abortion. See, that it's a big smoke screen, a big red herring. That's all this is people hiding behind one position to disguise what they really believe because they don't want to have to defend an extreme position. So those are the five bad ways people argue. Let me do a quick quiz. What are the three most important words? Syllogism, syllogism, syllogism. Five bad ways people argue. They assume rather than argue. They attack rather than argue. They assert rather than argue. They confuse preference claims with moral claims and they hide behind the hard cases. All right, so I'm going to stop right there. What questions can I answer? Do I have time to answer a few? I do, okay. Any questions you'd like me to answer, I'm happy to do that. I have a question. Yes. So I met um, a girl who had an abortion at a wedding. Well, 
just, I met this girl. You met the girl at the wedding. I met the girl at the wedding. She sat next to me and she was from Maine. And I asked her, oh, what do you think of politics? That's a normal thing. Well, you jump right into it, don't you? What do you think about politics? You don't hold anything back. You just go right for the juggler. Yeah. And I did not know in that moment how to respond to that. Well, keep in mind when somebody confesses to you they've had an abortion, you're you're kind of switching from apologist to more of a pastoral role at that moment. Yeah. And so it I don't think you had to have at that moment a knockdown argument to counter her claim. She probably was blown away that you just listened to her. And it sounds like that's what she did. Um by the way, you're saying something very, very important here. I don't know if you all heard it. She had the abortion because she believed the baby was just an amoeba. This is why abortion gets traction in our culture. Planned Parenthood and their allies in the media have relentlessly pressed this narrative that there's nothing there but tissue. And that, that is still there. It's still out there. I know we think we've moved beyond that. We haven't. And think about this for a moment. How come in red states like Montana, we couldn't even get something passed that protected children who survive abortion procedures? A major reason is a lot of the public doesn't believe they're human beings at that stage. So um, tell me what else happened after that. My husband got up from the table. Your husband got up from the table. He says, I'm out of here, dude. Yeah, I'm out. Yeah. Can I say I think you did the right thing trying to love on her and, and listen because probably you defied every expectation she had. She was convinced Texas Christian conservative, you're gonna just yeah, you're gonna yeah, you're just gonna nail her. Uh, that's what she probably would have thought. Instead, she got someone who listened and who had, who showed empathy and cared. And you tried, you, you gave her the gospel, which is the only antidote for post-abortion guilt. I, I'm hard pressed to say where you went wrong there. Don't confuse not having a an immediate knockdown refutation with being you didn't say the right thing. Sometimes how you are is just as important as what you say. Thank you for talking to her is what I say. Any other questions? Yes, Father. Kind of along those lines, Scott. How do you make a prudential judgment? This person is interested in actually an engagement of a constructive kind. This is going to be a nuclear war. I mean, right. like, how do you decide, you know what, this is just, I'm not going to engage this right now. Like, how, how do you make those distinctions up? Yeah, I do. In fact, there is nothing wrong with leaving a conversation where you're not going to be able to make your points. They're not listening. They're just trying to, what we call bulldozer the conversation. Bulldoze the conversation. So what I do when I'm talking to a bulldozer who won't listen to anything or acknowledge any point I'm making, I do what I call narrating the debate. You narrate the debate, you call a timeout, you say, can I make an observation for just a minute? I just gave a case for why I believe abortion is wrong. I gave you a syllogism. I'm very open-minded. I want to pursue truth. If I'm wrong, I want to fix where my thinking has gone bad. But I noticed you didn't refute my syllogism. You just called me names. You said I was a religious bigot and intolerant. And, um, you know, one time I asked a guy who said that to me, you're just a bigot. I said, well, what's a bigot? Somebody who thinks they're right. Do you think you're right? <laughs> you know, if not, why are you correcting me, right? I mean, so, but sometimes the, 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 the steamroller will get embarrassed that you called time out and he'll start to behave. Other times he'll keep going. I usually give him two warnings and I figure, you know what, I'm not going to do much here and that's okay. I do want to say something I said at lunch today that I didn't say here yet. It's very tempting to think that if you have not gotten the person to admit that they've been wrong all along and you are right, that you failed in your conversation. Not so. Your job is to do what my colleague Greg Copel says, put a pebble in their shoe. You ever had a pebble in your shoe? It wears on you and wears on you until you deal with it. That's your job. Give people something to think about. 
You know, when you were talking to that girl from Maine, and you maybe just gave her one little nugget that because you were kind to her, she her mind was open enough for that to get in, that can wear on her. We've got emails from our speakers that go out and speak, files of them. Hey, something you said two years ago finally flipped a switch on me. And it's tempting to think arguments have to be one on the spot. That's not true. Ask any married couple if arguments are one on the spot. Are they? No. no. You know when you're, I know when your arguments are one the same time mine are. My wife is right. I'll finally admit it a week later when I'm driving through Taco Bell alone, and I'll admit she had the better argument. And by the way, there's empirical studies that indicate this is pretty typical for human nature. William Rusher, who wrote the book How to Win Arguments More Often Than Not, argued that the argument is won three weeks later when the person is alone with his or her thoughts and they admit you had the better argument. And so don't think that you fail just because they don't immediately say, by golly, I'm so glad God put you in my life to straighten out my twisted thinking. Uh, that isn't reality most of the time. Yes, sir. Uh, in terms of the question is, Scott, how do you approach someone outside of a plant parent clinic, right? A woman's walking in, how do you approach them? What's your strategy there? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, rather than pretend to know what I don't know, I'm gonna give a caveat here. I am not an expert on sidewalk counseling. There are people who do that very well and would be much better at answering this, but I did ask a colleague of mine who is very good at it, a guy by the name of Eric Scheidler in Chicago. He's part of a group called Pro-Life Action League. I said, Eric, what's the best way to reach women who are heading toward the clinic? He said, our last message to them is always the same. We will help you. And then he said this though, but that's not the only message they get from us. When they're a mile away from the clinic, they pass our team out there with pictures of abortion, but the pictures of abortion are not at the clinic. They're a mile away. The last message the client hears is, we'll help you. You don't have to do what you saw in those pictures. We'll help you. I think that's probably sound advice. Good. I wish I could do better for you, but I will add on to that. If a woman who is facing a crisis pregnancy is not more horrified of abortion than she is terrified of her crisis pregnancy, her baby dies. She has to be more horrified of abortion than she is terrified of her crisis pregnancy. So I think that's why Eric uses both the imagery and the will help you message. Um, yes, ma'am. How do you convince someone that what is present at conception is um, well, one, you can cite the medical evidence, and in my book, The Case for Life, which, by the way, I, I didn't think we're, we were going to have any here tonight because my bags did not arrive with me today when I got in from Atlanta. Delta stands for don't expect luggage to arrive, if you're wondering. Uh, but I did go back to Love Field this afternoon and got my books. They were there. So I have 14 with me, exactly 14, and in that book, I have listed for you all the medical journals that say life begins at fertilization. For those of you that don't get a book tonight, uh, you need to become converted. No, I'm kidding. Um, I have an option for you. How many of you are on Facebook? Okay, here's the deal. Um, that wasn't very many, that was about three of you. I don't know if that's an embarrassment, you don't want to admit you're on there or what that is, but for those of you that are, if you go to the Facebook page, Scott's Lecture Notes, everything I said tonight about the five bad ways people argue, which is in the book, will, I will also get to you in the notes. The book has more detail, but I will have the books here when we're done. And uh, any students here? If you're a student, I don't want you leaving without a book. If you don't have money, you come see me. If you, if you're, if you don't have cash on you, we're gonna find a way to get you a book. Um, for the rest of you, if you've got anything over $10, I'll take it for the book. It normally sells for $100, but no, I'm kidding. Um, it, we'll sell it for 10 tonight for anybody who wants it. I don't want to haul them home so Delta loses them when I go back home. That's not what I want to do. Uh, who was, does that answer your question? And I'll give you in those notes the, the embryology sources for that, those claims that from the earliest stages of development were distinct living whole human beings. I was wondering if you thought it was even worthwhile to have these people who are consistent with abortion and um, like, child euthanasia. Because I've met one of these people who are like, yeah, we should be able to kill kids if they're 
There are people out there who have read Peter Singer and Michael Tooley and others who argue that being human means nothing. And they want you to believe that eating a, ha a hamburger is no different than eating a Harold Burger, as Christopher Kayser says, or that a hit and run with a squirrel is no different than a hit and run with a newborn. But you know what? Even our understanding of pathology refutes that. A six-year-old girl who can't read is a tragedy. A dog who can't read isn't one. Why? Because the six-year-old girl is failing to flourish according to her nature, while the dog is not failing to flourish according to its nature if it can't read. So everything we understand in medical science assumes human exceptionalism, and the burden of proof is on those who want to deny it. You should look at them and say, why should I assume there's no difference between a cockroach and a human being? Now, I will admit, on an atheistic worldview, there is no difference, because all living things are cosmic accidents. This is where the Christian worldview has far more superior resources to explain reality. We can ground claims for human value and equality. Why are we all equal in this room tonight? Because we all equally share the image of our maker. That makes sense. To an atheistic worldview, though, every living thing at whatever stage of development is a cosmic accident, the blind watchmaker thesis that Richard Dawkins speaks of. Nothing has intrinsic value and a right to life. It only has functional value. So we can explain dignity, equality, much better than our critics. Um, I saw a hand, yes, in the very back there. So how would you uh, say to someone who says, I may have already answered this, but uh, the question of abortion is uh, the suffering of conscious human beings, or that is, so it's inside the mother, so it's using her her body to live, so she has the right to kill it. This is where counterexamples can be very helpful. When somebody says to me the location of the fetus matters, I love to bring up fetal surgery, where they remove the fetus from the mother's body, do the surgery, and then put the child back. They did this, they pioneered this at the University of San Francisco uh, Medical Center under the direction of Michael Harrison. He started treating infants with herniated diaphragms by removing them from the womb, doing the repair, and putting them back where they're born at 40 weeks. So here's the question for your critic. Does that child, if location matters, does that child go from being a non-human, non-valuable being while it's in the womb to becoming one while it's outside, but then go back to being not one again when you put them back? I mean, this is what we call the episodic problem. It leads to absurdities. It's like the viability example I gave you later of the child that's viable in New York but not Bangladesh. Same thing. I mean, think about this. They remove the child. In fact, the press now calls these babies that are twice born. And uh, it's true. They get removed from the mother's body to get treated but then put back to be born naturally at roughly 38 to 40 weeks. So does that child go from non-person with any value to being a person to not being one again, I mean, this is silly stuff that they get stuck with. What was the second part of your question? Well, uh, I had a friend, and he was a little bit more intellectual than us, and he was, I was arguing with him, he was a lawyer, and he said, well, to me, I said the question of abortion to me is how much do you value the human life? And he said the question of abortion to him is the suffering of conscious being, or conscious being. At that point, who has the burden of proof, you or him? That's right. You say, what do you mean by consciousness? Do you mean actual consciousness? Well, that would mean then we can kill you when you're sleeping. Or do you mean having an immediate capacity for consciousness? That will protect you when you're sleeping, but not when you're under anesthesia. Do you mean having uh, a natural capacity for consciousness? Well, that would protect you while you're sleeping and while you're in surgery, but it would also protect the fetus because they too have a natural capacity they can't just exercise it yet, but they have the natural capacity for consciousness. Make him defend why consciousness matters. <coughs> Ask that Colombo question, what do you mean by consciousness? Yeah, that's good. That is what a lot of people do. Oh, by the way, just so you know the worldview idling behind that, and those of you that come from a Catholic tradition know this worldview better than those of us that come from Protestant ones, there is a worldview known as body self dualism that is dominant in our culture right now. Body self dualism says the real you is not your body at all. The real you is your thoughts, your aims, your desires, 
And therefore, you could say something like, well, I'm a man trapped in a woman's body, or vice versa, something like that. The whole transgender debate assumes body self-dualism, but so does the pro-abortion side and the abortion debate. That's why you get people who say it doesn't matter when your body was conceived. All that matters is that you have cognitive function, consciousness. The real you doesn't even begin until you have conscious memory. Of course, newborns don't have that, so it's going to exclude them as well as fetuses. Good question. Thank you. I'll take a couple more. Yes, sir. What do you do, and this is just a hypothetical, with all of the hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of frozen eggs that have been fertilized that are in clinics right now? Yeah. And if we believe that that is life, what do you do with those? Yeah, what about eggs? all these embryos that are on ice? And you're right, there's a lot of... There's a lot of them on. What was the last part? I'm sorry. I said, do you leave them frozen indefinitely? Well, the technology now pretty much allows us to. Technology now no longer has a problem with storing embryos indefinitely. It used to be it was a problem. It's not. But here's the thing. It troubles me when I hear Catholic and Protestant friends who use assisted reproductive technologies create more embryos than they're willing to take personal responsibility for. So I will tell you, and maybe not everybody in this room will agree, I am not opposed to assisted reproductive technologies per se, but I do think they have to have biblical fence posts drawn around them, and fence post number one is embryos don't get harmed, and we don't create more than we are going to take personal responsibility for. I get why people want to create more, because these treatments are hugely expensive, and something we all tend to downplay but should stop downplaying, the pain of infertility is real. We should not say to people, why don't you just go adopt? Can you, you know, imagine what that would feel like to a couple that is struggling to have children. That would be just devastating for them to hear a callous response from us that way. So I don't think we have to say that, but I also don't think anything goes when it comes to technology. So my fence posts are gonna be number one, no embryos harmed. Number two, procreation happens within marriage. Kids need a mom and a dad. I don't care what some social scientist tries to tell me. They need a mom and a dad. Now, that does not mean that if a kid is in a single parent home because of divorce or death, that that child is, is not going to be able to thrive. But it does mean we should not intentionally create children that we're not going to place in two parent families. So. That, that, that's a fence post. Another one is this. We need to be aware of the lessons these technologies teach us. What does it teach us when we are designing kids for parental fulfillment rather than receiving them as gifts as they are? It teaches us to create children and treat them as commodities. That's very problematic. So there are, we need to think about the worldview implications of the technologies we use. You got to follow up, go ahead. Yes, and I agree with you by the way. Um, but let's say hypothetically we pass legislation where you do not create more than what you need, right, yeah. for, in that situation. What do we do with the ones that have already been created? The only option we have currently is, is adoption, embryo adoption, groups like Snowflake. That's the only ethical option we have. We can't donate them to research because it's not right to kill one human to benefit another. Um, so the only option we would have is that. But again, I would say that we should not be creating embryos that parents don't take personal responsibility for. And uh, I get it. It's heartbreaking for parents who've come to the end of their procreative years and realize we've got more embryos than we're going to be able to bring to term. And I get how the industry pushes couples to create a lot of embryos in hopes they can get one or two. But we have to be very careful. We watch what worldview premises we start absorbing with all of this. Great question. Thank you. Does that help a little bit? I don't have a perfect yeah, answer for I don't you. Think there is perfect yeah, there isn't. It's really a tragedy. I'll take one more, I guess. All right. Some of you uh, want to know how to uh, defend your pro life view in a minute or less. I'm going to tell you how to do it. Pretend you're at school and you have a friend who comes up to you and says, hey, um, why are you pro-life? Here's what I want you to say. I am pro-life because it's wrong to intentionally kill innocent human beings. By the way, is somebody timing me on I this? Okay, good. It's wrong to intentionally kill innocent human beings. And from the <coughs> earliest stages of development, you were a distinct living and whole human being. You weren't part of another human being like skin cells on the back of your hand. 
you were already a whole living member of the human family, even though you had yet to grow and mature. And you know what else? There's no essential difference between you, the embryo, and you, the adult, that justifies killing you back then. Differences of size, level of development, environment, degree of dependency are not good reasons for saying we could kill you then, but not now. Did I get it done in under a minute? 38 seconds. 38 seconds, okay, I'm 62, I'm slow on the basketball court, but that's rocking it, okay? <laughs> Can I ask a question, how many Bible verses did I cite? But did I communicate biblical truth? Yes, I did. How many of you would wish you could have taken notes fast enough to keep up with me on that? Okay, pull out your phones and text LTI to that number. LTI to 229-258-6290. In about eight minutes, you're going to get set a, sent a link. You'll tap that link. There's a real brief form where you basically just put your name and email in, and you're going to get that sent to your phone, what I just said, in about seven, eight minutes. Now, here's what's great about that. It doesn't mean everybody will be persuaded, but now they've got to answer your argument. And you, you, you'll know the five bad ways that they will tend to argue against it, and you'll be able to plug their objection into their assuming rather than arguing, attacking rather than arguing, asserting rather than arguing, or hiding behind hard cases, or whatever else they're doing. Confusing preference claims with moral claims. So that sound bite will be sent to your phone, and you can have it. Again, those of you on Facebook, if you do not get a chance to get a book up here, if I don't have any left, go to Scott's Lecture Notes on Facebook, and I'll add you to the group, and I will post notes when I get back to my hotel tonight. Well, any other question? I'll take, I think I probably ought to let you go. We're getting late. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Go out there and give them heaven. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming this evening. Thank you, Patrice and Julia. Where are you guys? There they are for organizing this event and a wonderful job. Thank you, all, Phoenix. Delicious dinner. Um, you do have your advocate cards on your table, and I just want to briefly say we are in an exciting moment right now. We have two donors that have put together $100,000 each, and they are together giving us a $200,000 matching grant for any amount, for any new donor, and I think probably all of you are new donors to Council for Life, um, up to $10,000, so but any dollar will be matched and it'll have a huge impact for the pregnancy resource centers, the maternity homes, the targeted media outreach, all of the agencies, foster and adoption care, all of the agencies that we support, post-abortion hope and healing ministries. And so we are asking you to consider filling this out. You can do credit card, you can do the QR code on the on the back, you can fill it in, send a check, you can take it home and mail it in, but consider coming under this matching grant and making a double impact for your giving. And then the last thing I just want to say is Scott is equipping us to go out into the world because the world is fiercely pro-abortion. And the Dallas City Council last week voted to support 11 items of abortion support and access for our city in our state where abortion is illegal. That didn't stop them. The, the, the other side has had 50 years of absorbing a message about the right to abortion. And so that's why we wanted Scott to come and, and help us be equipped to have these conversations because we will be able to convince every city council member and every person in your neighborhood and workplace if we just consciously go through and talk this out because our words are our best weapon. So thank you again for coming tonight and we hope to see you at a Council for Life event again soon. Take care and God bless. <laughs>